somewhat famous for baking pound cakes. He worked in a dry cleaning business, but his love was music, everything from gospel to blues. And the music he recorded in the 1960s is still played today. He leaves his daughter Jackie and her family, three granddaughters, and a grandson who is due next month. He's also survived by his brother, two sisters, nieces, and nephews, and a tremendous community of friends. I spoke to Jackie, as I mentioned. She is in Florida, and because of all that we're going through, could not even get up here to be with her dad. And so our heart goes out to her and her family and his memory. Next up, Lieutenant Danny Francis. There's Danny. He worked for nearly 16 years for the Essex County Prosecutor's office. So to Ted Stevens and team uh, at that office, our hearts are with you. After retirement, he kept going as a civilian analyst for the Newark Police Department and to our brothers and sisters uh, in the Newark Police Department. Our hearts go out to you there as well. Danny was only 51 years old when we lost him on Monday. To know a little bit about his career, consider this. In 2006, he was recognized by the 200 Club of Essex County for valor in the line of duty for risking his own life to take down a known drug trafficker. He leaves behind his wife, Sarita Vega, and I spoke to Sarita as well this morning. By the way, she herself is a detective with the Essex County Prosecutor's Office. He leaves his wife, Sarita, along with two adult children, another who's in college, and a six-year-old son. So on behalf of our state, we thank Danny for his career of public service and for his longstanding, excellent work to keep our neighborhood safe. We will keep him and his family in our thoughts and in our prayers. God rest his soul. And finally, we wish to recognize the legacy of Jacqueline Cruz Towns. And there she is on the right. Many may know her as the mother of New Jersey basketball legend and NBA star, Carl Anthony Towns, but she was much more. She was a family matriarch and an enduring and constant present presence, not just in her son's life, but that of everyone who knew her. She also had spent, by the way, 20 years working at Rutgers University. Her husband, Carl Sr., also contracted COVID-19, but is recovering, and we keep him in our prayers as well. One story noted that it may have been Carl Anthony Sr. who taught his son the skills to play ball, but he got his emotional spark from his mom. She was only 58 years old. To Carl Anthony and his dad, and I spoke with each of Carl Anthony and his dad this morning, and their entire family and the broader basketball community, we send our deep, deepest condolences. God rest her soul, and I can say today, without any doubt in New Jersey, we are all Timberwolves fans today. These are only three individuals out of what is now 3,156 lives that we have lost to this disease. We don't take any pride or joy in recounting these stories, saying these names and seeing these faces and knowing there are quite literally thousands more we can memorialize does not make our pain or your pain or any of our pain and grief any less. But these lives should be the inspiration we need to keep working to defeat COVID-19 and to lower the toll this enemy is having on our blessed state. I've said it many times before, we have taken among the most aggressive positions of any state in America to slow the spread of this illness. We have asked you to make tremendous sacrifices with us in this fight. I know some of them may seem like nu nuisances, but every step we have taken has been made out of sheer necessity. I promise you that. I'll turn to a map that we've been looking at every day recently. The lighter the shade of the county, the better it is. Uh, and we're getting New Jersey lighter and lighter, and that's a good thing. The less bright orange we see, the slower the spread. That means we're flattening the curve, which not only means we're keep, keeping people from getting COVID-19, but that we're also lessening some of the immense strain on our health care systems. We're continuing to do everything we can to prepare for the absolute worst. 
as we've said, we've already been able to increase hospital capacity statewide, Judy, I think by 60%. We've set up three field medical stations in partnership with the Army, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and we've had beds set aside for our residents on the USNS Comfort. By the way, I mentioned this the other day, I want to put a name uh, on this, who's captain, and not today, but at some point, Danny, let's get Captain Joe O'Brien's picture up here. He's a New Jersey native, and as my son Sam reminds me, he is a graduate of Red Bank Catholic, by the way. Nothing, however, and I do mean nothing, would make us happier to come out of this realizing that we are overprepared. That would be our new best case scenario. The best mistakes we ever made in our lives. Because if we do, that means that you will have done the hard work of helping us pull through this. It means you took to heart our call to keep a social distance, not just most of the time or sometimes, but at all times, and to stay at home unless you absolutely need to go out or unless you, you are needed as one of the folks who are either an essential worker or helping us fight this virus. This is a war. It is the fight of our lives. And wars are not won by one person or one small group. They're won when millions of people come together in a common cause. Our cause right now is totally flattening the curve and then seeing it drop down the other side. And then we can begin the process responsibly along with our neighbors of reopening our state and beginning to live life in our new normal. But we only get there if this entire map in front of us gets to its lightest shade and stays, stays there. This is no time to let up. We have got to keep at it. And I just have to say this again, although I think the weather for the next few days is not gonna be terribly hospitable, but it's gonna be sooner than later, the weather will get better. All of us are anxious to break free. We completely understand that. We accept that completely. Uh, we, we can't. We have to stay home. Look at the progress we've made on that map. This is making a huge difference. That curve of positive test results, undeniably, 10 days now is increased at 10% or now meaningfully less. Uh, we need to keep it that way. We need to flatten that curve, which means fewer people get infected, fewer people in hospitals, fewer people in intensive care, fewer people needing ventilators, and please God, fewer people who pass. And as we continue to do that, Judy and Christina and Pat and all of their colleagues are building out that capacity of bed, beds, health care workers, ventilators, medicines, personal protective equipment, again, so that those two lines cross at a reasonable level and at a reasonable date. That is the charge to the nine million of us. So far, so good. No state has come close to what we've done in New Jersey. We could all not be prouder of the work that everyone is doing. We just got to keep it up. Don't take your foot off the gas, folks. Stay on this. I know you're itching to get out. You're itching to get back to normal. So am I. Who could blame you? We can't. We just can't yet. I promise you, the second we think we can, we will let you know that. You have my word. But for now, stay home. Stay six feet or more apart. By the way, I meant to say this, Judy, there have been some great homages. I saw one, Vin Gopal sent me an homage for healthcare workers gathering. Pat, you were on the text uh, somewhere in Monmouth County over the past couple of days. Uh, so the good news is everyone had a mask on. The bad news is they weren't six feet apart. And again, I want to repeat, unless you and Dr. Tan disagree, that nothing trumps social distancing. Six feet apart at minimum. Putting a mask on, even a crazy one like this, does not give you permission to get closer than six feet. So please, folks, we want to celebrate our heroes and healthcare workers, first responders, essential workers, uh, warehouse, supply chain workers, longshoremen. We want to do that with you. But we got to stay apart from each other. We cannot congregate even if we're wearing a mask. Stay on it, folks. You've done an extraordinary job. We will win this war, unequivocally, but only if we keep at it. Please, folks, stay at it. Stay home, stay apart, keep your face covered, and we will beat this damn virus. Okay, switching gears. Good conversation this morning with uh, Secretary Mnuchin. 
uh, talking about, again, the important need, uh, the overwhelming need for support and financial help from the federal government. And he gets it to his credit, and we're just working through. I spoke to Senator Menendez shortly thereafter and reiterated the same point. Individuals needed who are unemployed. We've got an extraordinary, over 500,000 people have lost their job. Small businesses need it in a big way. The state of New Jersey needs direct cash assistance from the federal government. Uh, it was a good conversation, again, a good conversation following that with Senator Menendez, comparing notes generally and also mentioning this point specifically. On testing, as the slide suggests, of our two FEMA-partnered testing sites, both tomorrow, April 16, and Friday, April 17. So I want to make sure everyone hears that both tomorrow, April 16, and Friday, April 17, only the Bergen Community College site will be open from 8 a.m. Uh, each day, maximum of 500 tests. Again, you've got to be a Jersey resident and symptomatic. The PNC Bank Arts Center will open again on Saturday, April 18th, and that will be exclusively for symptomatic first responders and healthcare workers. It will reopen to the general public on Monday, April 20. Again, repeat, Bergen Community College, April 16 and 17, so tomorrow and Friday. PNC, Saturday, just for symptomatic first responders and healthcare workers, and then uh, they'll go back to a regular schedule on Monday. I mentioned this yesterday. It has been clear uh, that we have had a imbalance between folks showing up to get tested at the Bergen Community College versus Home Dell at PNC Bank Arts Center. So again, words to folks out there, uh, as you're thinking about planning your days, this is really relevant for next week because we've got a different schedule for the next couple of days. Think through whether or not you can pivot to Home Dell because the lines have been shorter there. There are now roughly two dozen publicly accessible testing sites across the state that are listed in our information hub at covid19.nj.gov slash testing. Additionally, there are roughly 40 more privately run sites that your primary care practitioner can send you to for testing if you meet the requirements for testing. I think in total, the number remains at about 66 locations in the state. We have been in regular, I would say constant and deep contact for some time with the team at Rutgers, especially with Dr. Brian Strom, and, and Judy mentioned this yesterday, we've also been in discussions with the White House, the President mentioned Rutgers in a shout out yesterday, which was nice to hear, uh, and the White House, who notified, by the way, this past weekend of the FDA approval for the Rutgers developed saliva test and the potential for this new system to be put in widespread use to help us meet our testing needs. In addition to Brian Strom, I reached out this morning and left a message for Professor Andrew Brooks, who's part of that team. We are working intensely with Rutgers and specifically now with Middlesex County today to roll out this new testing system and we will closely monitor how everything goes. Nationally, and we've, you've heard this before, but it bears repeating, resources and PPE have been limiting factors to the testing regime. And we know what we need and we will advance every opportunity to increase mass testing. It is incredibly gratifying. I think it's a source of great pride for all of us to see New Jersey's own flagship university stepping up to help fill the testing gap. I am proud of the work at Rutgers and look forward to moving forward with them. And I know Judy and her team joins me in that. As I said yesterday, we're not alone in our desire to have more sites and more tests. We've wanted that from moment one. Every state in the entire nation is facing the same issue we are. But as I also noted, we also have conducted the fourth most tests of any American state. And the only states which have conducted more state, uh, tests are states whose population are significantly larger, New York, California, Florida. This doesn't mean, however, that I'm not continuing to push for more testing supplies and support at every opportunity. I've made this clear to the White House and to our congressional delegation. And we've seen some successes, and we've mentioned this. We've, we have received the commitment from FEMA to keep our partner sites at both Bergen Community College and the PNC Bank Arts Center up and running through at least the end of May. And we are a rare state that uh, got that support. And as I said, I will not let up until we have everything we need to successfully fight COVID-19, whether that be testing supplies, personal protective equipment, 
uh, ventilators, you name it. We're going to turn over every stone anywhere literally in the world to get what New Jersey needs. And of course, by the way, at the same time, we're going to continue to ask each of you who can help us to please continue to step forward. If you have any PPE to donate, no matter how large or small your stockpile, please reach out to us at covid19.nj.gov slash PPE donations. You can see the website right there. Or manpower. If you have prior experience as an EMT or a paramedic or as a physician or a nurse or a respiratory therapist or any of the other medical specialties, we need you among our volunteer corps. Please visit covid19.nj.gov slash volunteer, as you can see, to sign up. A couple more brief items, Judy, before I turn things over to you, if I may. First, I want to recognize another one of the truly good stories that's coming out of this emergency. And this one was sent to us by our dear friend and great leader, Senator Loretta Weinberg. And Loretta lives in Teaneck, which we know has been one of the Bergen County communities most impacted by COVID-19. In fact, you could take Bergen County out of that statement. It's one of the communities that's been most impacted uh, in this state, if not this country. The science director for the Teaneck schools, there he is on, on the left, Rolando Montserrat, came across the plans online for producing face shields. And his first thought was how to make enough to make a difference. Using his own personal 3D printer and borrowing three others from the TNEC schools and with the support I might add of the TNEC PTO and alongside one of his students, and that's the gentleman on the right, sophomore Elias Sanchez, he has been able to turn his home into a mini face shield factory. They just donated their first 340 face shields to Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck. And God knows that Mike Marin and his team at Holy Name could use all the help they can get. They've been incredible heroes in this fight. Additionally, the Teaneck schools have donated the goggles normally set aside for use in their science labs and gloves from their nurses' offices to members of the township's ambulances. This is the essence of the community coming together. So that to the Teaneck Public Schools, NJ thanks you. And we ask you all to continue highlighting the everyday people doing extraordinary things by using the hashtag NJ thanks you on social media, and we will keep sharing their stories. Finally, before I close, I wanna pay tribute to two folks who did not, uh, and Danny, hold on a second, who did not literally uh, uh, die directly from the COVID-19 reality, but they have passed. First one, I just spoke to his widow, Ann Luzato, Gordon Litwin. Gordon was 90 years old. He died again from reasons other than COVID-19. We don't have his picture because I called an audible at the line of scrimmage. Um, Gordon was the chairman, however, of the Hackensack Meridian Health System which is extraordinary that Gordon left us uh, in the middle of this fight. And his, his widow Ann said to me unequivocally, he would be right there with Bob Garrett and the rest of the team uh, in the engine room. Uh, he was a giant in our state. And Gordon, God bless you. And uh, we, we, we wish Ann the, the, nothing but the best and have her in our prayers. And we lost a dear friend and great leader uh, as well yesterday in our state and a dear friend of mine, Professional Firefighters Association of New Jersey President, Dominic Marino. Not sure why, but known to many as Don, uh, notwithstanding his name is Dominic. Again, we didn't lose him to COVID-19, but his loss leaves a huge hole in the hearts of many, including yours truly. I put it last night in a statement, as a firefighter, Dominic would run into burning buildings, but he would just as quickly run through walls if it meant helping his fellow firefighters. There's a reason his members look to him. He never stopped working for them, never stopped thinking about them, and never stopped living and breathing the life of a firefighter. Personally, Dominic was a friend whose opinion I greatly valued, especially on matters related to his members. 
Whenever it is I leave office, one of the greatest days of pride that I will look back on will be the day that I sign the Thomas P. Kenzanella 21st Century First Responders Act. That law gives our firefighters and members of law enforcement greater protections when their health is impacted by their line of duty work, like the illnesses that many suffered as a result of their efforts at Ground Zero following 9-11. Getting that law passed was one of his great passions. It might as well have been named after Dominic, frankly. He was by my side when I signed that bill, and I am forever honored to have been the governor to have signed it. But beyond that, wherever a firefighter or a department needed help, you'd find Dominic. He was one of a kind, a firefighter's firefighter. To his wife, Ellen, with whom I spoke yesterday, and you can only imagine he literally dropped dead yesterday afternoon, and their three children, and I also spoke to his daughter, Rachel, and Pat knows well as a New Jersey State Trooper and a, someone who I've gotten to know over the past couple of years. Uh, he leaves two grandchildren. We thank you all for sharing Dominic with us all these years. He will be deeply missed by many, many, many in this state. And so to you, Dominic, God bless you, buddy. Thank you for your service. You will never be forgotten. And with that, please help me welcome the woman who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persa Kelly. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the Department of Health continues to work aggressively with our partners uh, to expand our bed capacity in the state. Uh, the field medical stations, as I've shared in the past, uh, two have opened, Edison and Secaucus, and we expect Atlantic City to open next week. Uh, the Secaucus site currently has 47 patients. Uh, 25 more will be accepted this afternoon. And overall, uh, they have already served a total of 79 patients and discharged 32 of them. Uh, the Edison Field Station currently has 14 patients. Ten more will be admitted this afternoon. Uh, overall, uh, that field station has served 19 patients and discharged five to date. Uh, these field medical stations, along with the brick and mortar uh, hospitals that we're bringing up, will provide more than 1,600 additional beds in our state. And these beds, uh, in addition to the work that all of our hospitals have done to increase their capacity, uh, will help us handle uh, the surge that we, we are in in the north and expecting throughout New Jersey. Last evening, our hospitals reported 8,270 hospitalizations of patients uh, with COVID-19 or persons under investigation. The daily growth rate in hospitalizations is 3%, uh, down from uh, uh, the observed rate of 4% yesterday. There are 1,980 individuals in critical care, and 1,705 of those individuals are on ventilators. That's 21% of the hospitalized patients with COVID-19 or persons under investigation on ventilators. 86% uh, of the ICU patients are on uh, ventilators, uh, slightly down from that peak of 97% uh, uh, a number of days ago. Uh, since April 4th, uh, there have been 6,300 patients uh, diagnosed with COVID-19 or persons under investigation discharged from our hospitals. So while the numbers we report every day are grim, uh, over 6,000 discharges serve as a reminder uh, that people are getting better and they are overcoming this illness. As the governor said, we are still looking for healthcare professionals to volunteer. The state is in need of EMTs and paramedics to support our current workforce. Individuals whose EMT certifications have expired within the past five years are eligible for COVID-19 EMT reentry. We've also granted a waiver for EMTs from out of state who want to help us here in New Jersey. To sign up, please visit covid19.nj.gov slash volunteer. Additionally, we still need nurses' aides for our long-term care facilities, and we're encouraging all student nurses to sign up. Today, we are reporting 2,625 new cases for a total of 7, 000, uh, 71,030 cases in the state. Sadly, 351 new deaths uh, have been reported to the department for a total of 3,156 fatalities in our state. 
55 of these new deaths were residents of long-term care facilities. Of the deaths, 51.7% are documented as white, 21.9% black, non-Hispanic, 15.5% Hispanic, 5.7% Asian, non-Hispanic, and 5.2% other non-Hispanic. On the underlying conditions, the trends are holding 60.4% cardiovascular disease, 37% diabetes mellitus, 29.6% other chronic diseases, 20.9% chronic lung disease such as asthma, emphysema, or COPD, 15.3% chronic renal disease, 15% neurological or neurodevelopmental disability, and 11.4% uh, cancer. Uh, there are currently 358 long-term care facilities in the state uh, documenting uh, individuals with COVID-19. 6,815 cases have been reported from long-term care facilities. In our veteran homes, <clears throat> there's a total census of 800 veterans between the three sites. 160 veterans have tested positive for COVID-19 or are persons under investigation. A total of 45 deaths have been reported. In our psychiatric hospitals, <clears throat> excuse me, out of a census <clears throat> of 1,400 patients, 97 have tested positive, or 7%. Out of the staff or employees of 4,800, 237 have tested positive, or 5%. And six deaths have been reported uh, among our patients. According to data from this morning, seven laboratories reporting uh, 131,967 uh, tests uh, have been performed, 58,976 have returned as positive for a positivity rate of 44.69%. That concludes my report. Thank you again for staying home and maintaining social distancing. It is making a difference. Stay connected, stay safe, and stay healthy. Thank you. Judy, thank you. Um, just a couple of quick follow-ups I made. The counties are, are, are holding the same in terms of the, where we have the most positive tests in order. Bergen, Essex now a little bit ahead of Hudson. Hudson is third, Pas uh, Union fourth, uh, Middlesex fifth, Passaic sixth. Um, did you, you didn't do race and ethnicity, did you? Or I, I was making notes to myself. Uh, if you uh, I did, uh, I could do it again. No, no, I, that's my bad, no, I, I, I don't wanna make you do that. Uh, we had a, a conversation earlier, um, uh, including the Lieutenant Governor and, and Judy and Pat, myself um, uh, and others. Um, I know that there was, a, there was a call last night, I believe that yeah. you, the Lieutenant Governor, Carol Johnson, Senator Rice, um, First Lady. Tammy Murphy uh, was on with the Black Doctors Association. I know Sheila is doing a town hall, I think, tonight with Mayor Ted Green in East Orange. Trying to get at this question, is it's been bouncing it around at around 50% higher representation in fatalities among African Americans than we have in, the, in society writ large, and just sort of trying to talk through the reasons for that and then Judy the ones that I took away from our call among others were the d density of the living condition mm -hmm. um, overall access or lack thereof to health um, as you call comorbidity uh, underlying uh, a disproportionate amount of underlying health uh, challenges on a going in basis to this crisis and, and, and a disproportionate representation in the workforce that is still going to work every day. Exactly. Uh, nurses, first responders, essential workers, et cetera. Is that, is that a fair? Uh, it's exactly what we discussed, we yes. And so those are things that we gotta continue, as they say, to unpack. And it's not like we weren't focused on those on a going in basis uh, before this crisis ever occurred. But now this, like a lot of other things, this, this really shines a light on the, weaknesses and the, and the inequalities in our society. Again, I want to give the Lieutenant Governor a big shout out, Senator Ron Rice, who's been a leader on this um, 
from, from moment one. So, and on the veterans, you mentioned 45 lost lives. Just to, to, for folks out there with loved ones in those homes, 29 of them, I believe, in Paramus, 16 in Menlo Park, but none so far, and I'm knocking on wood in Vineland. Um, and that's something I spoke to the Secretary of Veteran Affairs about uh, yesterday. So, again, Judy, thank you for everything, including your report. Colonel Pat Callan, any you got on compliance, on PPE, on, on other matters? Thank you, Governor. Uh, very briefly on compliance on overnight, uh, Hoboken police responded to a uh, burglary reported. Subsequent investigation led them to the arrest and charge of a subject who had broken in through a uh, front window and was found in possession of uh, alcohol and cigarettes. While being processed, that subject coughed at the police, indicating he was COVID-19 positive. Perth Amboy Police issued two executive order violations. Salem uh, issued one executive uh, order violation. Uh, in the wake of a motor vehicle accident where the subject provided uh, false information. Uh, in Lodi, up on Route 80, a Jersey trooper uh, was pursuing a vehicle in excess of 130 miles an hour, subsequently broke off that pursuit. The subject was later identified at a gas station by another trooper who then again went up on the Route 80. Uh, they did not pursue him, but subsequently had enough to charge that individual who turned himself in up at the total of barracks uh, with his attorney. In Elizabeth, three uh, individuals were cited for a violation of the executive uh, order. And in Passaic, an additional th three were cited as well for the EO violation. In Hillside, one cited. Uh, and in Newark, uh, always leading the charge, 88 executive order violations and five businesses were shut. Um, and although uh, the commissioner touched upon it, Governor, I just think just the one piece that is the stark reality of this is the mortuary affairs. That is a daily discussion for us. It is not an easy discussion um, between our chief medical examiner, the medical examiners, the funeral directors. Uh, a few steps that we've taken, DEP this week issued a waiver to allow crematoriums to, off, to uh, extend their hours in order to assist with the stress that our uh, systems are under. Uh, the Attorney General I spoke with this morning, he is working through consumer affairs to try and extend, and I think will be successful in extending the hours that cemeteries can operate. We're hearing that from our funeral directors. Uh, beyond the mortuary trailers that we have, one component that I just will stress before I turn it back is the crisis counseling that goes along with the uh, the not normal process to have to deal with that much death. So we meant to make sure that we built that crisis counseling into all of those that are working through this mortuary affairs issue. I know we use the term resiliency a lot, uh, and some people think that that's bouncing back. Uh, but in this instance, we're not sure people can ever bounce back. So we use the term bouncing forward because none of us, I don't think, included us here and around the country and state will ever really be the same. So that resiliency piece, I think is going to be monumental as we move forward to the uh, to the other side of this governor Pat really well said um, let there be no doubt uh, I, I don't think anyone is ever going to be the same uh, especially folks who have lost loved ones uh, but even friends in broader communities uh, and again we have to sometimes talk about things that are uncomfortable and there are meetings that go on uh, and these two folks uh, are in most of them that are not meetings you ever thought you'd have. Um, and so thank you uh, to each and every one of you who are part of it. And just know folks out there, we're with you as best we can every step of the way. I will just say this, notwithstanding the compliance challenges, and, and you go over them in our pre-call and you went over them here, Pat, it has to be said, yes, there are still knuckleheads out there who are claiming they've got it and spitting on people and coughing. But the overwhelming compliance is, is just a, so impressive in our state. Uh, and we just have to thank each and every one of you out there, each and every one of the nine million folks in sometimes really hard circumstances. I mentioned the density of cohabitation we have in so many communities and so many homes. It's not easy. We, we understand that. And the only plea I would have is we're not out of the woods. Uh, we're not, I don't think we're, we, I don't think we can see the tree line yet, to be frank with you. But we will get there, and I promise you we will let you know the minute we know, or at least what we think uh, we're getting there. And we're dealing with, you know, we're dealing 
with models all the time, trying to assess, as we've said many times, best and worst case. Uh, but I, I know one thing is if we fall off the wagon, if we stop adhering to the stay at home edicts and the stay at home pleas that we've made and the social distancing pleas, we will blow through any worst case assessment uh, on any current model we're looking at. And that, that number of 36,000 still hangs out there like a storm cloud. Uh, it could have been, as we said a few weeks ago at this point with the charts, it could have been 3 million of us or more getting infected. But even with all the good work we've done, we take our foot off the gas right now. We swamp, no matter how good a job these folks are doing, and they're the best in the nation uh, right now at what they're doing, uh, we'll swamp the boat. So please, again, thank you for everything you're doing to stay home and stay away from each other. And please, God, continue to do that. And I promise you we will let you know the minute we think it's safe to go back on the water, as they say. John, I assume there's no truth to the rumor that you sat there all night and compiled more questions, but you are in the same place you were yesterday, and with that, we owe you uh, the first uh, questions. Martel, thank you as always. Thanks. Uh is the state tracking where people are dying, uh, whether that's at home, in the hospitals, nursing homes, and any comparison of deaths in hospitals by hospital comparison? Uh, and we're getting concerns from doctors who are concerned about practice at the hospital due to this all hands on deck, uh, concerns about practicing outside of their specialties, practicing in, in, in emergency situations. Is the state... Uh, uh, Department of Health handling complaints about medical practices right now. Is there anything that's popping up that you're concerned about? Uh, and Governor, you pushed back the income tax uh, the filing deadline. What's the status of the May property tax deadline? And there's a looming sales tax uh, payment deadline as well. Any movement on that? Uh, and last night, Governor, you, you tweeted a, about a chat with Dr. Eric Ding. Um, and technology, his technology for contract, contact tracing. Uh, there was some pushback by Harvard epidemiologists and others about his credentials. Um, is that something you're, you're concerned about now? And can you detail what you're doing now to start doing contact uh, tracing in the future? I'll, Judy, I'll take a few that are on my side and hand it to you, is that okay? Mm -hmm. um, Income tax, again, extended. I want to make sure folks remember this because it's April 15th that your, your income tax is not due till July 15th. Nothing to report on May property tax or sales tax. Uh, I did speak to Eric last night. I was not aware of any pushback in his credentials, uh, but we had a very good conversation. You probably have seen, because I've deliberately tweeted about this, we're trying to get, I've mentioned multiple models that Judy and Christina and their teams and I and all of us look at. We're also trying to get as many different perspectives from this, from all sides, from all shapes and, 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 and sizes. And he's, he's somebody, as you rightfully point out, John, who's been particularly good at con app development, contact tracing. Um, nothing specific to report on, on that, um, other than we know the, uh, the, the, the broad reality is, again, remind ourselves, sequencing is beat the crap out of the virus get it down as close to zero, get it down to a manageable reality where Judy and Christina and the experts can say, okay, we're safe to think about reconsidering some decisions we've made. Then it's a responsible reopening. Again, you only get re economic recovery on the back of that healthcare recovery. And you need healthcare infrastructure, you need protocols in place that frankly we don't have at the moment that we will need before we reopen. That's, that's you know, and again, Judy will correct the record here, but the, at least two elements of that. Number one is broad scale testing that has a very quick turnaround. Easy to do, big numbers, you get it back fast. That's why the Rutgers work is so interesting to us and to so many, including the White House. And secondly, and Judy, I think and you and Christina would agree, you've got to have a really robust not just in theory, but in practice, contact tracing program in place. So if you bring the community spread, if you ring that down to as close to zero as possible, you begin to reopen, you've got to have both of those elements in place or I don't think you can reopen. Um, and so no specifics beyond that. We're looking at lots of different models right now. Uh, I, I do know someone who uh, is positive. 
who gave me a very encouraging readout of a conversation with a contact tracer that took, that, that took place this week in New Jersey in terms of the professionalism, the quality of the questions, the, the understanding by this person. I'm not even sure they were a healthcare worker. I assume they were, uh, but it was an encouraging sign. The only discouraging part is we're so swamped fighting this war, it took a lot of days between the, con the positive confirmation and the conversation. Um, I think that's all I've got on this side. Back over to Judy, is that okay? I guess, Judy, we had um, uh, tracking where folks are passing and doctors operating outside of their specialties or their, their particular lines. Yeah, and there's so many physicians who have volunteered. I'm going to start with that. Um, and are, um, you know, just helping us in our field offices uh, or stations, helping out in hospitals. Um, I have not gotten complaints. I can honestly say from physicians. I have gotten um, emails with suggestions that are all very positive. Uh, and last night on the phone call with the New Jersey Medical Association, the Black Physicians Group, uh, they brought up some really uh, important points uh, for us to consider, uh, particularly those that are practicing actively in urban centers and the inability that they have um, to uh, do telemedicine. Uh, to take care of, uh, of their patients. Um, so it's something we have to consider. And uh, a pediatrician brought up a really uh, uh, good point that um, we, we need to continue uh, childhood immunizations. Uh, that, that's something you can't do by telemedicine. And it's so important because we certainly don't want to see the uh, incidence of those uh, uh, childhood diseases that we can eradicate with vac vaccines. Uh, come up again because we didn't continue immunization. So a couple of things to work on. So the suggestions from physicians have been um, uh, very positive and we're considering all of them. Um, maybe um, Dr. Tan can talk about the, um, the uh, death certificates and how you're not only confirming uh, the death through the death certificates now, but also location. Um Actually, we would probably have to get back on um, how detailed some of that information is. Um, currently, what we're doing right now is that we're looking at our electronic um, death records. They have to go through a process of um, what's called um, uh, a registration where um, the uh, death certificates are ultimately finalized uh, by um, uh, through a certain process, but we'd have to get back as far as like the level of detail of um, some of the uh, information that you're requesting. Thank you, John. Elise, do you, do you mind uh, jumping in? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We have heard from a company stating that it's been airlifting patients from New York City to places including New Jersey. Is that so? Have any more governors signed on to the regional approach to reopen, and have you come up with any target dates for any aspect of that? And regarding test kits, if you get more, can you process them? Do you have the ability to acquire test kits on your own? And what about for the Abbott quick test devices, which came with so few uh, swabs? Um, I'll take a couple and then, Pat, you may want to come in in addition to Judy here. I'm not aware of anybody getting airlifted to New Jersey, but I'm, that may be just me. Yeah, I'm not either, so. Okay. So if you have more details on that, we uh, would like to hear it. I spoke with Mayor de Blasio uh, last night. I probably should have said that. And we're comparing notes on a whole range of things. Um, and uh, obviously, they've been ground zero. The regional approach, uh, Massachusetts got added. I'm not sure. I think that's public knowledge, Elise. Massachusetts, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, is that's public. Uh, and that's important. That's a state that we compare ourselves to a lot in many respects, including health and higher education and, and uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, importantly, a governor, uh, a very good guy and a guy I've known for uh, 48 years. I went to high school and, and college with him, uh, a, a Republican. So it's, it's, someone, it's, it's someone from the other side of the aisle in addition to being a good governor and a good guy. Targets on the regional approach. I think we're trying to uh, make some announcements as early as tomorrow. Please don't hold me to that in terms of the, at least who will form the membership of the council. And I think their intention was to have a first meeting of that council very quickly thereafter. 
And Dan, you may correct the record if you know something otherwise, but I believe that is the, the current, um, that's the current. So we're, we're, each of our states have been going through trying to make sure we've got, again, a chief of staff plus a medical or healthcare expert and a, and a real economy uh, expert. Kitts uh, and Abbott, any comments from either of you? I could, I could talk briefly just on the Abbott. I think as far as the distribution, and I, we could probably get you the exact distribution plan, at least, was to keep two at the state lab right in West Trenton. I think a regional approach with north, central, and southern with our primary health care providers. Um, I think the turnaround on them, it, it, even though it's three to 15 minutes uh, based upon the studies that have been done, we could probably do up 100 to 300 a day with those Abbott tests, which um, isn't a lot, but I think the, the main focus is to have them at acute care facilities and long-term care facilities may be where they may be, and I'd certainly defer to Commissioner Percy Kelly, where they may be most informative uh, given the, the struggles that we're having at our acute and long-term care facilities. Commissioner. Judy, I don't know that this is necessarily either public knowledge or accurate, but compared to the three to 500, Pat, is that what you just said a day? Uh, one to three hundred. One to three hundred. Pardon me. Um, at, at some point, the Rutgers model, at least among others, was talking about ten thousand potentially, right? That's what he's reporting. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, I don't have firsthand knowledge of that, but that's a, that sort of scale. Uh, we're still trying to think through. It's fair to say, and Dr. Tan would be a far more expert on the side. How many tests you you'd need to be able to do a day in New Jersey to have that responsible healthcare architecture in place so that you could feel comfortable about reopening? And it's I suspect double-digit thousands. Uh, uh, so that's something we're still toying with. Thank you. Do you have something, sir, in the back? I can barely see you back there. Uh, hi. Uh, Dave Schatz, New Brunswick Today. Um, I was wondering on the, um, if you can, uh, I think Elise just asked you about it, but on the back to work plan and the, um, anything more on the um, different aspects of the regional and also was wondering on the testing, if the uh, private, uh, retailers and businesses were still in the picture as far as providing uh, testing at their locations like CVS yeah on the on the regional uh, approach um, not a lot new to report today but it's it's a whole lot of discussions going on so you got sort of if you could think of it th in sort of three rings one is what we're doing in New Jersey that's a constant and, and we were having a discussion, some of us today, you've got the firefighting team and you've got the where do we go when we put the fire out team. And whether we like it a lot of the members of those two teams are overwhelmingly the same people. Uh, so that's constant. The next ring out is the regional uh, uh, grouping of seven states now that Elise was asking about. And that's early stage, but each of the seven states, it's fair to say, are having similar deliberations as to our deliberations. So our point there is to have some amount of coordination. Best practices, certainly. So if we see something that another state's doing that is really impressive, that we like, uh, we'll, we'll have no shame to rip, rip a page out of that playbook and apply it. But it's mostly to harmonize and coordinate. Again, under the theory that we did that when we were closing, let's do that when we're opening. Again, this is a little bit of a broader group, but I think that's a good thing. And we're the densest state in America, and this is the densest region in America, so there's a lot of commonality. And then the third ring, and these are, that's why I've said this a lot, it's not either or, it's and both. There's also the coordination we will need and want to have and desire to have with the federal government. There's no, there's no replacing the existential uh, reality of the federal government of the United States of America. We can't print money, they can, they've got resources that we don't have either any one of us or even those seven states combined as significant a piece of the country's economy as that is. Um, and so it's all three of those and it's not one over the other, it's not one or the other, it's and, and, and. Um, we'll, we'll continue to 
aggressively. We've got 66 different locations and testing sites. We're fourth in ter terms of total uh, tests only behind states that are California, 40 million people, uh, Florida, 21 million people, New York, 19 million people, New Jersey, 9 million people uh, per capita. We're, we're punching way above our weight, but it isn't where it needs to be. It's very frustrating. It is not where it needs to be from day one. We haven't had uh, the support that we would have wanted, ideally, particularly from the federal government, to been able to do the, the, the universal testing. So as we broaden that out, that will include, without question, private sector. I know CBS, which is based in Rhode Island, is, is doing that there. Those are models that we will, will embrace wherever we can. And, and again, scale will be key here. Thank you. You good, sir, on the camera? You good? You're good? You're making up for yesterday, I assume? Come on down. Don't want you to feel left out for yesterday. I, I appreciate that. Uh, Ian Elliott for NJTV News. Uh, Colonel Callahan, yesterday you mentioned uh, the state is expecting to receive a decontamination unit and would likely send it to University Hospital to extend the lifespan of their N95 masks. Do you have any more information on when the state expects to receive it? Uh, Governor, you say you've uh, taken a data-driven approach to this virus in your response. Are you looking at Google mobi mobility data, and did that influence your decision to close the parks? The April 5th report showed a 26% increase in people using parks in New Jersey. Pat, do you want to start? Sure. Is that it? Uh, Ian? Uh, I might have a follow-up, if that's okay. That uh, Battelle decontamination system that we talked about yesterday actually arrived this afternoon uh, and I was uh, misspoke when I said it would be physically at university it's actually going to be kept in Edison right adjacent to that uh, field medical station we are currently working on the logistics on the collection uh, how the decontamination and then the redistribution of that uh, Kathy Bennett uh, this has been a special report from CBS 2 News we now return to our regular programming